Photography is not my profession. It is my obsession, but it's not my profession. I'm a zoologist, naturalist by training. I started, you know, as a, uh, a zookeeper 36 plus years ago and kind of worked my way up. And my whole thing has been working for wildlife for conservation. So wildlife photography became something for me in the sense that I would write papers to get them published about conservation projects that I've been working with around the world. And they say, well, you need, we, we need some of these images to go with the papers. So I said, well, I don't have any images. So I went to the stock agencies. I asked them for the images. I saw some nice images. I'll take this one, this one, and this one. They told me the price. And I said, you're out of your minds. For that money, I'll buy my own camera. So that's what I did. I just bought a camera back in the film days, and I just started practicing, you know? And I did what I think a lot of people do. I think we get the magazines, you know, the pop photo, the shutter bug, all these magazines, and try to get all the tips. And you start looking at all the contests and things like that. And like I tell people all the time, I said, you know, I would look at these contests and say, well, that's really great. And then I'd see a winner, and I'd say, well, that's not so great. And the bottom line is that photography is subjective. So what I tell people all the time is, if it's important, if you like it, it's a good image. If you like it, it's a good image. I think that's what photography is for most of us. It's just trying to, to capture a moment, something special to remind us of how lucky we've been to live this life that we're living. That's what photography is all about. We as photographers are storytellers. So in that vein, what I have to do is I try to, to raise money and try to raise attention for conservation, to help animals. And you can go up and talk all you want without images to make that connection, to tell your story, you're never gonna get anywhere. So I'm gonna tell you two of my favorite conservation projects that I've dedicated half of my life to working with and show you how it made a difference, and how you can make a difference as a photographer. With those images, you change people's lives. You make that connection. There's an old saying that says, in the end, we protect what we love, we love what we understand, and we understand what we're taught. And photos can teach us so much just by seeing them. Cheetahs have always been a huge, a huge love of mine. I look at these animals, and the first time I saw one in captivity, I said, my gosh. And I realized the struggle they were going through in the wild. Um, so I was able to start getting into photography where you know my images were making the cover of magazines pretty prestigious magazines back then and I want to show you how I use these images. This, this is not a technical workshop. I know this room is considered the technical work, but I'm not really a technical kind of guy. But I'm just going to tell you a story and how you tell the story about these things. The Built Cheetah Research Center in South Africa was a place at the time that was breeding more cheetahs in captivity than anywhere in the world. They really started a great thing. This woman named Ann Van Dyke, she is to cheetahs what Jane Goodall is to chimps. She taught me how to be around cheetahs, how to work around cheetahs. She had this magic hand in working with these animals. And she's the one who brought up into my mind how important it is to protect this wildlife. The cheetahs are special animals. Now, I don't want to, you know, you look at an image like this, you go, oh my God, they're gorgeous. I want to have one. I want to pet one. Not really, because again, it's a wild animal. You can see this part of a cheetah, but then you'll also see this part of a cheetah, okay? <laughs> you have to be very, very careful. Um, and again, Getting into the technological part of this, you know, these images, I know what cheetahs are going to do. Cheetahs will never attack you, okay? They do a lot of barking, but very little biting. But I know the behavior, and I can see the tail twitch. So what I do here to get a shot like this, you'll never get this by clicking it once. All these people that say, oh, my God, what? I know they're going to click this shot. You know, these guys who think they're gods with all this stuff. No, no, no. As soon as I see, man, I put my finger on the shutter. I've got a, you know, a great camera that can get 10, 12 frames a second. Even if you've got one that gets five frames a second. Press the shutter! Then you can pick out your shot, and you'd be amazed at how fast that happens and how incredible this equipment is to capture that focus coming at you. It's fantastic. It'll make you feel alive. It really is fantastic. So you start at the very beginning. You know, working with cheetah cubs is just a, a huge privilege. They're amazing animals. Uh, and look, you think he's smiling? He's not smiling. He's spitting at me. Okay? These little things, when the minute they're born, they're little spitfires, but they're wonderful to watch grow up. Man. And you look at an animal like this and I'm thinking, what a privilege it is to see, but understand that everything in Africa wants to kill cheetahs. Lions, leopards, hyenas, all the predators want to kill cheetahs. They want to kill the competition, which is why cheetahs are diurnal animals. They, they hunt during the day, which is most of those other predators are crepuscular and nocturnal, sunset and, and at dark. But you know, you can't look at a face like that and not love that animal. I mean, come on. And you see the bond between a mother and the cubs, and you see the maternity. Maternal love is really incredible. So this is what I wanted to do. I want to protect these animals. I work at a zoo, but I didn't go to work at a zoo to work for an attraction. If a zoo is just going to spend a million dollars on an exhibit for an animal and not invest money into protecting that animal in the wild, it is nothing more than an attraction and you're being hypocritical. I'm very proud. The thing I'm most proud of in my entire life is I've been able to go out and raise enough money where I started an endowment down in Miami. It's called the Ron McGill Conservation Endowment. It's got a million dollars in it that I was able to raise by myself. And interest in that goes out to help conservation projects, things like this. I've been able to fund a lot of things. Um, the zoo, it's called Zoo Miami now, but now it's called Miami Metro Zoo. But I did things like I purchased trucks. Okay, 
purchasing these trucks for the rangers to use out in the field. We would help these cheetahs. We'd go out and do uh, surveys. This cheetah's not dead, it's anesthetized. I'd bring you know, vets and, and get them together. This was a cheetah that had actually been hit um, by a car, believe it or not. And um, this is one of our vets working on it. This is a cub that she saved. I told a story yesterday about this incredible woman and, and saving this cheetah. So here we go. We talk to the farmers. We go out and tell the farmers what we're doing and why we're doing it. If the farmer thinks it's the cheetah that's killing this animal, we'll teach the farmer and we'll go out there and we'll move. We set up traps, we trap the cheetah. Once the cheetah is trapped, we take it in, and what we've done is we work with preserves that want cheetahs. Remember, people are going out to Africa now to see animals, and the preserves have said, we want cheetahs in our preserve because people will pay to take pictures of cheetahs. Here's the thing, we as photographers, we don't usually want to take pictures of cheetahs with a big collar around their neck. Everybody wants to get the cheetah looking natural. You got all these collared animals out there, and it's taking away from the photographers to get that shot out in the wild. So what we do is we trap the cheetah, they're not really happy, we dart them. Get them in La La Land, we bring them into the area, we'll do this stuff a lot in the field, we have garages and stuff out in the preserves in the field, we put them in the back of the truck, and we start doing the exam on the cheetah. We'll take that exam, there's Anne there. This cheetah has already been snared, as you can see, the, the scar on its leg, that's from a snare from people trap, trying to trap the cheetah. Here I am in my much younger days. Um, helping out, and the veterinarian, this guy, Peter Todd, he's just unbelievable, the work that he's able to do out there. And then this is going to look a little gross and a little tough, but let me tell you what's happening here. We're making an incision in the abdominal wall of the cat, and inside we insert a transmitter. It's a big transmitter, okay? Um, but it works. It's got its own code on it, and by putting that transmitter in, we don't have to put a collar on the cheetah. The preserve then pays a tremendous amount of money for that cheetah, which we split with the farmer, then goes to the, to the preserve. Now we have a cheetah on the preserve. That's not, not that it did any damage to the livestock in the first place, but that farmer didn't believe it because he saw the cheetah during the daytime. And when he sees the cheetah during the daytime, and then all of a sudden, the next morning, he sees a cow dead or a sheep dead, he assumes it's the cheetah. When in reality, we show them the tracks. We say, oh, look, it's a caracal. This is a leopard. Or this is a hyena. I don't care. I want the damn cheetah out. Okay. So we move the cheetah out, and we work with these different preserves to do that. Once the thing comes out of its la-la land, it's not very happy. It'll kind of make a couple of spits and charges at you, but it never comes at you. The thing is, you never turn your back. If you don't turn your back, I trust me, these cheetahs are not going to come and get you. Just always face them, you see. It really is, it can be intimidating. Even me taking the picture, this is right here. And he's, he's coming at you. But listen, it's great. You understand the animal. That's my biggest advantage as a wildlife photographer, is knowing my subject, knowing the behavior, knowing what they're going to do and why they're doing it, you see. So then, once he runs off, he realizes it's free, then we get to track him. And this is really exciting. This is where I had the greatest time ever because I get to fly. But I don't get to fly in like regular planes. It's basically a kite with a lawnmower engine. And I get in this thing. Oh, this is fantastic. You have it. I'm telling you, folks, you, I just, you get in this thing and you start flying. I'm getting all hooked up. I didn't tell my wife I did this until after I got back because I had to sign off on a thing that says I can't do anything like bungee jumping or skydiving or flying in kites over Africa, Africa planes. But man, you get in this thing, and then we, that's how we survey. We put on the radio transmitters, and we're flying this kite. You know what a feeling it is to be under a kite, and you're gliding over this natural habitat. You're listening to the beeps, tracking the cheetah, and then when you finally get to see the cheetah, they tend to go along the fence lines of the reserves. You can't see it yet, but do you see it now? Okay, so I'm shooting this from the plane. That's another thing. Have you guys ever done that? You ever guys try to use a long lens and shoot through the, you get sick. You don't focus on it because, oh, wait a minute, I'm not feeling really good. Oh, start doing this, start doing live view. Um, but, you know, this is how we can track them. And the reason why they run along the fences of the preserves, because they learn very quickly they can run their prey into the fences. You see, they run their prey into the fences and it slows them down and they're able to take, it, take advantage of them. And then we have people on the ground to do the same thing. So we can track the cheetahs that way. So this is a conservation effort where we've been able to go out there. And when I tell the story, when I show these things, when I go to you know, possible uh, philanthropists in Miami or any place I'm speaking, and I say, this is the story of what we're doing. This is why we have to save this animal. People come to bat. They help you. They save the animal that way. And that's a real important thing. It's just tremendous because I'm telling you, folks, to know these animals, to see them, to, to work with them is such a huge privilege. And though many of us will never get an opportunity to go to Africa to see them, this is the importance of zoos. And I know there's a big controversy with zoos these days, and there's a lot of zoos that should not exist. There's a lot of these roadside attractions, these horrific places should not exist. But if you've got good accredited facilities that are really sinking money into conservation and doing things. What we at zoos are, zoos are an insurance policy against a very uncertain future in the wild. Animals are being wiped out in the wild, and I can tell you that there are several species of animals, the Arabian oryx, the California condor, the black-footed ferret, that wouldn't exist today had it not been for zoos, breeding them in captivity and putting them back out into the wild. Um, 
All the Arabian oryx in Africa today are descendants of zoo animals. This is what we have to do. In a perfect world, we wouldn't need zoos because everybody would be able to see these animals in the wild, but we can't do that. So I think we have an obligation to do that, what we learn, and pouring money back in to be able to see them in this type of environment, to be able to see them in the wild. And what I was able to do there is go to Tavilt, the place that I showed in the beginning, cheetahs that were, ha that were born in captivity. This is Savannah, she was the first one, and this is King George. He was a king cheetah, one of less than 50 in the world. And I bought them back. They were born in captivity there, and I bought them back to Miami. I worked with South African Airways, and they flew them over for free. And you know what it's like when you get back with Savannah, for instance. This was the flight crew that flew her over with me from Savannah. This is in Miami International Airport. You know what kind of looks you get when you pull a cheat out onto the terminal? <laughs> and, the whole, and the whole flight crew, the captain and the flight crew are there. It's partnerships, folks. This is what you do with photography. You build partnerships, people who care. Every one of those crew people love cheetahs now, and they talk about it to all their other friends, and they understand that the cheetah is not the man-eater people want it to be. I've been blessed to bring the cheetah up to um, the United States uh, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Training Center, West Virginia, where we do presentations to kids, to schools. This is what zoos are for. This is what makes a connection. You look at the eyes of these kids. You look at the way people look at these animals. That's what you need to do. Again, there's that other saying that I said, you know, you protect what you love. That's how you make that connection. Look at the way these people are staring at that animal. It's not out of fear. We're teaching them the right things. I brought them on a variety of television shows where we go on, you know, this is Lori Marker from the Cheetah Conservation uh, Fund. And there we are here on Fox TV in New York. Brought them up to New York. Here she is. Here I am with Isabella Rosalini. You know, we make these connections. You got to make people care. And photography is the best way to do it. When I do my presentations and I show people these things, it's a great thing. It makes, it makes people care. This next picture, it's just for me. It has nothing to do about making people care. But I want to be able to tell my grandchildren one day that I slept in a motel with a cheetah in the bed. Okay? Because that's what I've been able to do. She sleeps in the bed next to me. She watches TV. It's fantastic. I'm living the dream, folks. This next picture is one of my favorites. You know why? This was in Chicago. We were doing a big thing uh, for the Conservation Fund in the Maasai Mara, and I was doing a presentation with our king cheetah, one of only 50 in the world. So imagine we order room service in our Chicago hotel, OK? And the guy comes up with the room service. The door opens, and the cheetahs are going This guy screamed like a little girl. But where do you have room service in your hotel, and you got a king cheetah eating next to you eating the room service, OK? This, these are the memories. These are the things that, you know what, even today, and this was several years ago, but even today I look back and I think, man, did we really do this? Did we have this time? That's what photography is all about. Telling the stories, preserving the moment, because like I said before in my previous talks, every minute further away from that image, that image becomes more valuable. And when you get into years, when you get into decades, you're going to look back and you think, I'm so glad I took that split second to do this. You can never take too many images. That's the thing you got to know. Now I'm going to show you about the, pro the most proud of in my entire life. It's the Harpy Eagle Project in Panama. This bird is the most amazing bird on the planet. I'm not really a bird guy, OK? But this is not a real, this is a bird. The Harpy Eagle, give you an idea, the bald eagle, everybody knows our national bird, right? Incredible bird, right? The bald eagle looks like a Manhattan pigeon next to this thing. The harpy eagle is the largest, most powerful bird of prey in the world, found in the rainforest of tropical America. Very rare bird. I did the study. I was very married. Uh, very I'm very lucky to be married to a, a woman of Panamanian descent. I went down to see her family in Panama, and I'd never seen a harpy eagle in my life in real life. So I went down to see her. This is Panama many years ago. You wouldn't recognize it now. These are the smallest buildings in Panama. It's incredible. This is a, you know, at the uh, Panama Canal Zone, which is what it was known for. Here you see the Panama Canal. You see all kinds of great birds. If you want to get some great uh, wading bird shots, go to the Panama Canal locks, because the birds learn very quickly. All the fish get trapped in those locks when they're doing the opening and closing the locks. It's like a smorgasbord there. So they but the great thing about Panama, folks, is this. The entire banks of all the Panama Canal is this beautiful rainforest. It's a necessity because that rainforest acts as the sponge that soaks in the water and prevents all the soil from leaching into the river, into the canal, so it doesn't have to constantly, constantly be dredged. And you go into these places, folks, I'm telling you, it's heaven. It's the most beautiful tropical areas. Everywhere you point is just a gorgeous image of the tropics, of the animals, small crocodiles, bigger crocodiles, really big crocodiles. It's fantastic to see this. Wake up in the morning, it's like that gorillas in the mist morning when you look at the hillsides in the forest and you hear the sound in the distance, you hear the two cans. It's just, it's heaven. It's the soundtrack of heaven. You look at these emergent trees, and it's such a wealth of wildlife. It's not Africa. People think that, you know, you're going to go to the rainforest, and I'm going to take pictures of jaguars and tapers and anacondas and all this stuff. No, 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 no. 
You may hear those things, but if you see them, you're really lucky because the rainforest is just this plethora of green plants, incredible reflections, looking up, looking at the size of these buttress roots. People don't realize how big they are. I'm a big guy. Look at me at the base of this tree. Okay? These are huge trees. These are hundreds of years old. They're so wide. This tree was there the time Columbus came. Okay? I bring my assistants with me to work down there. You look at the little animals. You talk about the things that are all over the place, the golden frogs. Look at, you know how you find boas? You find little boas in Panama, find a place where the trees have fallen and the lights come in and all the haliconias are growing. And the boas get, the little young boas always get in the haliconias. Why? The hummingbirds come to the haliconias and they wait there, the hummingbirds will see the boa, and they grab the boa and they grab the hummingbird. It's fantastic how nature works. I showed this before, the bats, the toucans, the toucanets, oh, and the hummingbirds. Enough cannot be said about these hummingbirds. By the way, every one of these pictures I'm showing you, there's about a thousand that really sucked. So you understand that when I tell you that, okay? I, I, this is another thing. People see these presentations and they think, oh my God, why can't I shoot like that? Well, because you probably haven't taken a thousand shots. This is the one I told yesterday. It's really funny because it's a, oh, what a great, boy, you lit that perfectly. No, I didn't light that perfectly. The guy next to me happened to shoot the frame at the exact same time, so his strobe went off and it gave me this great effect. I went, thank you. Um, had nothing to do with me planning anything. But it's great to look at it. The, the, again, the variety of birds. I get up in the canopy and you look at all these birds flying around, the snail kite. But we're not talking about snail kites. We're not talking about hummingbirds. We're talking about the harpy eagle. This is the bird right here. Many people look at it and say, it looks like an owl because it gets that dish in its face. Well, it gets that dish in its face because it's a rainforest bird. It doesn't depend as much on its eyesight as it does on its hearing. You guys go to NFL games. You see those guys on the sideline. They got the big plastic parabola mics. Okay, that's, that's the... The premise of the face mask, it's the same thing that you see in owls or nocturnal birds, right? They have a facial disc because they're funneling all that sound into their ears. So when they hear something, they'll open up that hood, that, that dish on their face to get that because normally they look like that. See, they look like an eagle. But if they hear something, something alarms them, whoa, they open it up. Then they get that perfect little facial disc that governs all the sound in. Because again, the sound is more important in the forest than the sight because they're being obstructed by all the trees in the canopy, you see? The big thing about these harp eagles, people think about the, the beak is the dangerous part. It's not the beak, folks. It's these talons. They have talons that are bigger than grizzly bear claws. I have watched these birds at 50 miles an hour take out a full-grown sloth, a howler monkey, and keep on flying like an F-1 fighter pilot. Unbelievable. So here's my thing. I'd never seen a live harp eagle in my life. I dreamed about it since I was a little kid. I'd seen pictures and books. The first ones I saw were at this little zoo in Panama. I used the term zoo in parentheses because it was really just a little prison. And it was a bittersweet thing for me because here are my first two harp eagles that I saw in this horrible little cage. And I went, oh my God, they're in this horrible chain link cage. It was just terrible. Something we can do. And they said, listen, we have no money. Who runs this operation? The mayor. I said, oh, okay, I'm going to write a letter to the mayor. I write a letter to the mayor. And everybody laughs at me. Oh, the mayor's never going to talk to you. Oh, you know what? The mayor invited me out to breakfast. We had breakfast. And I said, Miss Mayor, we need to do funding for this. And she says, Ron, I love these birds as much as you do, but I'm the mayor of Panama City. If I allot funds, to help build a better birdhouse when I got people complaining of potholes, not picking up garbage, and the people of Panama said, I'll be crucified. And she made sense, and I understood. I said, OK, Ms. Mayor, let me go out and try to raise money for you on your behalf. I'll raise it. So it's restricted to the And she said, absolutely. And they gave me the fancy letters. You know, in Latin America, they give you the big gold stamps and the ribbons and all that stuff, so you get the letter. So the first thing I did was, and again, I'm just a zookeeper. But this is where you got to have your will to know that you can make a difference as one person. I wrote a letter to the U.S. ambassador. I wanted to meet with the U.S. ambassador to Panama. Sure enough, he met with me. Here I am meeting with the U.S. ambassador to Panama. So, Mr. Ambassador, I need a list of all the major corporations doing business in Panama that are going to help out. Maybe give me some money for this conservation project. He gave it to me, and I started writing letters to all of them. So I write all these letters to everybody, and then all of a sudden, I get a phone call from Sony Corporation. Sony is headquartered in Panama for all of Latin America. And they said, you know, Mr. McGill, we're interested. We'd like to hear your presentation. I said, oh, great. My gosh, what are we going to do? We're going to send the president of Sony from Tokyo to Panama for you to give a presentation to him. I go, what? Yes, Mr. Akaigo Kaji is going to come down to Panama. And you're going to, and I'm like, holy God, now I'm pressured. I'm a young guy. You know, I'm thinking, oh, geez, I've already spoken to the mayor. I couldn't believe I had breakfast with the mayor. Now I got the president. So what I did was, you guys remember the show Wild Kingdom? Yeah. All right. Well, my hero, since I was a little kid growing up, was Jim Fowler. There was Marlon Perkins who did a lot of talking, but Jim did all the cool stuff. I wanted to do the stuff that Jim did. Make a long story short, I met Jim 25, 30 years ago. Jim and I are really close friends. He's a mentor to me. And I started thinking to myself, okay, I got to do a presentation to the Japanese. 
they kind of were impressed with people that they know, right? And Jim was in the peak. He was doing the Johnny Carson show and stuff all at that time. I called Jim. I go, Jim, I need you to come down to Panama with me. So I do this presentation to the Japanese about the Harp Eagle because Jim's really good about the Harp Eagle. He loves the Harp Eagle. So we're going to save it. I said, okay. So Jim flies down. He meets me. Here's me and Jim years ago down there in front of the old Harp Eagle cage. And here's me and Jim when I presented to Mr. Akahigo Kaji from Sony. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I'm doing this presentation to Mr. Kaji. And Mr. Kaji's there with a couple of his vice presidents in the Sony headquarters room in Panama. The guy flew in from Japan. And I'm doing, okay, Mr. Kaji, look, this is what I got. And I'm kind of an animated guy, as you guys probably already figured it out. So I'm doing all this stuff. I'm saying, we got to do this. we got to save this eagle. This is what we got to do. Listen, the Japanese, you know, you guys want to do something for conservation. People are kind of, you know, they're getting on you about the whaling and stuff like that. I know you want to do stuff for conservation. And I'm doing all this stuff. But, you know, the Japanese are very, I don't want to paint with a broad brush, but they're very businesslike. They're very professional. They don't wear their emotions on their sleeves when it comes to business. And I have the utmost respect for them because I have no control about my emotions when I talk. So I said, you know, and I said, and that's why you got to save the Harp Eagle. And Mr. Kashi looked at me and goes, oh, uh, we discuss, we come back to talk to you, Sean. So they walked out of the room. I look at Jim. I go, we're not going to get squat from these guys. They, they didn't even crack a smile. I'm up there doing the Lindy going crazy, not going to do anything. And he goes, Ron, the Japanese are very savvy business people. Wait and see what happens. Mr. Kaji comes back and goes, you give a very good presentation. We begin by giving you $250,000. $250,000, holy crap. This is unbelievable. Make a long story short, it evolved to close to a million dollars Okay, that they gave me. So what I had to do to work with these people is I had to meet the people to work with these eagles. You gotta, if you're going to do any kind of conservation work, you've got to work with the people who live with these animals every day. You can't go in there and, and, and profess to say doing it, because as soon as you leave, unless you've really changed them and involved them in this thing, it's never going to work. So I work with the people like the Kuna Indians. Uh, I work with the people at like the Chocos. The Chocos are amazing. These Choco Indians are fantastic. This guy is 80 years old. 80 years old. Look at his feet. You see how they curl around? That's because they climb trees. These guys use his feet like hands. He climbs trees. This guy's 80 years old. You know what really ticks me off about all these indigenous guys? They never lose their hair, ever. <laughs> they all have a ton of hair, all of them. And they're not really big people. Rainforest people are not very tall. You can see here's a couple of the chiefs with me. Okay, so I kind of, but they never lose their hair. It's just amazing. So what I had to do is I gave them a, a GPS unit to go into the forest to find a harp eagle nest. And when they found a harp eagle nest, what I did was I said, put in the number so I knew what it was, so I could find it. Because I can't take days going through the forest looking for the, for the nest. But the indigenous people know where they are. They found it. They gave me the GPS. So I got a helicopter. This looks like borderline helicopter. It's like a Toys R Us kit. But, <laughs> That's what I had in Panama. So we go, and we go into the forest. We find this forest area. And man, you're flying over this forest, folks. Again, you can't stop taking pictures of the trees, the, everything. This is my crew. Then we lug through the forest. This is my team going through the forest. We found the nest on the top of this tree. We had to shoot a line. We use a, a crossbow with a, uh, a, a fishing reel on the, on the bottom. And we shoot the line to the top of the tree. And we hook up the line. And I'm climbing up to the top of this tree. Because we know there's a harp eagle nest up there. I climb to the top. I get to the top. This is the view from the canopy, 120 feet up. That's the view to my right. I turn to my left, and that's the view I've got. I'll never forget it for my entire life. The greatest single wildlife moment of my life, folks, and I've done some really cool things in my life, but this is the one that sticks with me more than ever, anything I've ever done. As I sat up in that nest, in that tree, 120 feet up, looking at a harpy eagle in a nest that's you know four feet wide, five feet wide, three feet deep, and you're sitting up there, and it's swaying. And mom's looking at you. Again, the picture stinks. It's not a great picture. But it's a picture to tell the story that this mom is looking at me through the trees and she's going, yee, yee. And I'm looking at my side, I go, is this going to be a problem? He goes, no, 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 just relax. And then we set up a trap to catch, catch the, the parent. And once the parent gets in the trap on the top, once we got down from the nest, we pull the line, boom, we got him. Okay, then my assistant goes up there and grabs on the line, which is incredible. We put ace bandage around the talons because this way they can't open the talons. The talons is the pro are the problem. That's the danger, not the beak. He's not trying to peck you at all. Then we fit him with a little backpack because on that backpack, we're going to put a transmitter on that backpack. We take all the data while we're down there in the field. You see the backpack? He's wearing that little transmitter on his back there. That transmitter has a solar battery on it, and it'll work for two years. That bird will fly around, and we'll be able to look at any time of the day on our computer and see where that bird is. We find out exactly how much range it's using. Then we release the bird back into the wild. You see that bird fly off with the transmitter on its back. We get tremendous data. Data. We can watch that bird raise its chicks. We gave the data that was needed to the government to protect this forest. Is these pictures, these images, these stuff that we were able to get that convinced the government, yes, we have to protect this forest, convinced Sony to give me all that money. We built the greatest Harpy Eagle Center in the world in Panama with money that was raised from that first meeting with Mr. Kaji and Jim Fowler. We were able to get a whole national movement. We did a thing where we had all the kids come. Sony built all the studios and everything throughout there. We had this incredible facility for harp eagles flying all over the place. We had the dignitaries from over Panama come. 
invitation only. We had everybody. I mean, you know, the secretaries, the secretaries of state, the vice presidents. It was everybody was there. The harpies were flying through this beautiful exhibit now, not in this horrible little cage. We had a nest building. Then I got a call from the president of Panama. Folks, I don't know how to explain to you what it's like for a zookeeper to get a call. I uh, said, excuse me, His Excellency, uh, President uh, Nesto Bayadares would like to speak to you. And I'm like, I'm thinking I'm getting punked. I think it's not real. But I, uh, well, Mr. B President Bayadares is a Harvard grad, uh, so he speaks perfect English. And I remember I said, what can I do? He sent me a, a letter, but then followed up with a call, said, what can I do to help you make this? We're so proud of the attention you brought to this harp ego. I said, Mr. President, I want to have a an art contest for all the students in Panama to paint a harpy eagle, write an essay on why the harpy eagle's important to them, and then I want you as the president to pick it as the next national postage stamp for the Republic of Panama. He loved the idea, he says, let's do four. And we did a set of four stamps. We had this contest through the entire country. Well, school children painted the harpy eagle, they wrote essays, and what we're doing here, we're, we're educating people. We're educating. Sony donated a bunch of Trinitron TVs, Trinitron way back when, um, Trinitron TVs to, to, to give to the runners up. These kids who won the contest, it was amazing. I took harpy eagles, I took them around. We went to schools in Panama, harpies that we raised. We educated them about that, okay? And then the thing that was most important to me was we were able to get in front of Congress, the Panamanian Congress, and we lobbied Congress. And a few years back, one of the proudest moments of my life is when the Panamanian Congress passed a law that designated the harpy eagle the official national bird of Panama. And that was a huge thing. They changed their crest. They changed the badges of their police badges. They changed everything. Everything's harpy eagle now. You go to Panama, everybody knows the harpy eagle. Then at our zoo, we had a harpy eagle born hatch out, one of only three zoos in the country. And this was the first harpy to hatch out at our zoo. And I watched its mother raise it up, and we named it Panama in, the, in honor of this, this project that we had here. And this is the mayor when I presented her a plaque in Panama with the zookeeper who takes care of the chick, uh, congratulating her, saying that we named it Panama. And here's the best part of the story. We took Panama when Panama got older. We caught her up. We did the exam on her. She wasn't very happy about it. Um, but here she's getting a pre-ship exam. I got with American Airlines. Again, I said, listen, American Airlines, American Eagle is part of your, you know, your, your brand, right? There's no more incredible American Eagle than the Harpy Eagle. Remember, we're still in South Central America. It's an Eagle of the Americas. They loved it. They gave me 50 free back and forth flights to Panama to do everything. And they agreed to fly Panama down there for free. So I put her in the kennel. I put American Airlines all over the place, a little Panamanian flag. They brought in, this is when, when American first merged with uh, US Air. They bought their first painted plane to MIA to bring Panama to Panama. So I was able to go down on the tarmac, the media was there, we brought it in, loaded her up in the thing, invitations coming out from the mayor's office. Folks, when I tell you that the arrival of this bird into Panama, you would think it was like Kim Kardashian coming off the plane. No, I'm not joking. This was unbelievable. Sony Corporation sent out their things. When I got off the plane, I was mobbed by the media. I mean mobbed by the media. All Not just little media, all big media, CNN. We did the entire national morning shows. The arrival of Panama, this was a huge thing. So you understand what we've done here. We've, we've, we've changed the mentality of a country. The same thing that we did with our bald eagle, I do was able to do in Panama to have pride behind this magnificent bird, which is what we call an umbrella species. Listen, in conservation, folks, it's very difficult to get people to want to care for the Key Largo wood rat, okay? Because it's a rat to most people. So what you look for is you look for an animal that we call an umbrella species. In other words, an animal that needs a tremendous amount of area to survive. By protecting that animal, you have to protect a tremendous amount of habitat that's home to many other animals. You don't have to worry about the minutia of little animals that might not click with people. But you know, as a human being, we tend to be, especially in Panama, I'm a Latin person, so I know we like the machismo, we like the strong, we like the proud. Here you got the harp eagle, the proudest, most powerful bird of prey. That's our bird. They would ask me in Panama, they'd go, well, if we put a harp eagle in a cage with a bald eagle and they fought, who would, who would win? I go, the harp eagle would kick its butt. Yeah, that's our bird. Okay, we're going to go for the harp eagle. <laughs> you know, I get up there. Then the U.S. ambassador and the mayor gave me the key to the city. I'm thinking, oh, my God, are you kidding me? Am I getting a key to the city here? The people came out for Panama's introduction. This is when he was introduced. She didn't want to go out at first. But when she went out, folks, let me tell you, she flew up to the top of that exhibit. She was magnificent to look at her up there. It was one of the most incredible things you could ever imagine, to see this bird flying up there, see her stand up there. And to give you an idea of how incredibly popular it was, every newspaper in Panama, not just Panama City, but in Panama, all of them, it was front page news. <laughs> they fill the whole pic, the new home of Panama. You know, Panama thrives its summit. My name is Panama. Every paper was a huge thing. 
Es una belleza. She's a beauty. I mean, Panama is her new home. Every newspaper. It was just incredible to watch this. They started doing coloring, coloring books for all the kids in school. Again, images. You see, images are what's doing this. Connecting the people. The coloring books. I did a story that was, again, a cover story for Wildlife Conservation Magazine. It was a cover story for so many different other magazines. This doesn't work without photography. You can't just write this. People today are not into reading long stories. Look at kids. What are they doing? They're on their phones like this. They're just looking for images. They're looking for quick bites. These images are the key to making this conservation work, to show how we can do things. This is the Connect magazine. This is the, the international uh, magazine for zoos and aquariums. I mean, it was just unbelievable to see what you're able to do just by using images to get people to connect. Whereas 15 years ago, I can promise you 95% of the people never even heard of, of a harpy eagle in Panama. Now, it's their emblems. They're, for all their marketing, companies have harpy eagles as their marketing emblem, everything. Again, it's building a brand using the, 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 the conservation message. These banners are all over Panama City. They now have a Harpy Eagle Day. There's a National Harpy Eagle Day in Panama. It's called Festival Harpia. And they have thousands of people that come out and celebrate. All the big organizations, their national uh, wildlife police, like their US Fish and Wildlife Service, they changed their logo. Their logo now is a Harpy Eagle. Okay, for their wildlife service. People like the Smithsonian go down there and they're talking about the harp eagle. All these scientists jump on board. One of the biggest mistakes we make as conservationists is we tend to preach to the choir. We tend to be more concerned about connecting with other conservationists than we are with connecting with the people who live with these animals. We've got to make the people who live with these animals every day care, and that's how you do it. By opening it up, having these theaters, having kids come in, doing it, you're watching the kids take over. It's the greatest reward I have is to look at these kids who come in there and take it over. They take pride. They take ownership of these animals. They do their own things. They make their own demonstrations. Now this mascot's got to go. It's a really bad mascot. But at least they're working on it, okay? At least they're working on it. Kids make harpy eagle cookies. They make harpy eagle cakes. It's just such an amazing thing to see how they're going. To see the culture. They do dances about harpy eagles. To see the girls do the harpy eagle dance in their beautiful uh, cultural outfits. We've changed the mentality here, folks. And I'm a nobody. All of you out there are probably a smarter, smarter than I am. I want people to understand, especially kids, when you believe in something, you can go out there, you tell the story, and you can change a nation. We changed a nation. The harpy eagle now is a symbol of a nation. It is the top of their national crest. It's on all their coins. It's on all their marketing. It's incredible. They have harpy eagle contests for little kids where kids drive up as harpy eagles. Okay, Look at this little girl. From a young age, she's going to grow up. She's going to know what a harpy eagle is. The power of photography, okay, getting it to go. This next photograph is my favorite of them all because I'll never forget it. This is when it really hit me what an impact it was because I'm sitting there and people are coming up and saying things after we had this official Harp Eagle Day. The president had made this resolution about the Harp Eagle being a national bird and all this stuff. And this little girl, I'm telling you, she must have been five or six years old. And I didn't take this photograph, but I'm so glad, happy for the guy who did because it's one of the greatest memories I had. This little girl came up to me and in Spanish. She looked at me and she said, thank you for saving this bird so I can show my children one day this bird. And I'll never forget this because this little girl, you could see in her face that she really appreciated what we did. This next generation is going to make a difference in protecting this wildlife. I need to make it to make sure that the images of this wildlife are the, not the only things that these kids can see that these kids can get out to a forest, that they can look at the harp eagle, that they'll always be able to see it. But images are the things that preserve these things and remind us of what was and what should always be. The saddest thing in the world would be to show somebody a picture and say, that's what it used to be. Uh, wildlife is, is really important, folks. Whether you live next to it or not, this planet's not defined by political barriers. This planet is all one whole living thing, and it all has a connection to something else. And I, I'm not one of these extremists. I think extremists in any form are dangerous, OK? But I think there are things that we can do to make this planet better for everybody. There's another old saying that says, we have not inherited this earth from our parents. We are borrowing it from our children. And we have an obligation to keep this as healthier or healthier for them than it was when we got in here. So I really appreciate you all listening to this. I hope you can understand that everyone has the ability to make a difference and that photography is the greatest tool you can have in communicating that message to people who don't have the ability to be there. And once you make that connection, you can inspire people to lead that next generation. So thank you very much. I'm right on time. Perfect. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.